Welcome to the Michigan Golfer Show. Join us each week as we explore the people, the places, and the events that shape our great game. This is an interview we take with Eric Kersher at Boyne Mountain Resort uh, some time ago. Uh, exciting interview with Jack Berry, and we'll be doing the lead a bit later. Mr. Kersher, we're going to ask you a series of questions. Jack Berry, Dean of Golf Writers, as you know, uh, has a great history and knowledge of the game of golf and about some of the things you've been involved in, so he's going to be asking you most of the questions. Okay. Everett, uh you made Michigan the number one resort in the Midwest and started out from a very small operation. You were a skier then, an outdoorsman. How did this all evolve that you got into coming up north here after you've been going out to Sun Valley for so many years and you picked this hill to start what's turned into uh, an enormous operation, biggest family-owned recreation operation in the United States? Well, we started in, uh, in, in 1948 here in Boyne Mountain, mostly by, mostly as a, as a, as a lark, and uh, we didn't expect to make, make a business of it, and uh, we certainly couldn't have, when I knew all the skaters by their first name <laughs> <laughs> in Michigan, and uh, <clears throat> And uh, so we started as a, as you know, as a, as a, as a, we bought a used lift from Sun Valley for $2,000, a junk lift. And it was the first lift ever built in the world, and it still is in operation. And uh, where do you have that uh, working now? Well, that's, the, that's this lift that's uh, on, uh, on Victor and Aurora. And, uh, it was the first, that's the first chairlift ever built in the world when, when they started Sun Valley. It was a, supposed to be a, you know, a, a pretty classy operation. And so they couldn't afford it in those days a, uh, a tramway or an aerial tramway, which is up in the six to seven million dollars in those days. So they, uh, they settled for a, a contest Union Pacific was started in Sun Valley, so Union Pacific had a contest among their engineers who could come up with the best concept for a, for a lift to take you up a hill, and uh, which and it has a, it couldn't be a, a, a gondola that would be that be too easy a guess, but uh, and too expensive. So they, they, uh, they had this contest, and they they used to load with, this engineer knew of a device 
to carry bananas off off a, unload off a, a ship, you know, at, at, at right. one let two levels, the same same level, not up a mountain. And uh, they concluded that if you could if you could move, move bananas, bananas, you could move steers, right? <laughs> a, a, a mile away, they might take it up a hill. So they started experimenting with it, and they they put a a, a, a hanger head, which they had to fashion themselves, on a pickup truck, and they drove the pickup truck along to see if you could load people at what speed. Well, once they found that out, why well, then they they could build it. They could build a lift, and that was the first chairlift ever built anywhere in the world. Now, when so, you when you got into that and you brought the lift here, were you thinking of it as being uh, that this was going to be a weekend well, for the uh, same. fun for you and, and your friends, or well, did no, you look at it as a business? Well, we're going to start boring, and it has to be has to be a, a unique uh, transportation. Transportation has to be nearly as good as you can make it. And that, you, that knowing that they were building chairlifts, uh, that became our first choice. So then, how did so I built a single chair? And I, and I didn't have the money to buy, buy a, a brand new one. That might have been thirty-five thousand dollars. But the, so, a lot so of money just, at that time. That's right. right. I can remember when, at Walloon, there was a house, and I didn't be able. To, I was living in a hotel at the time, and uh, they went forty thousand dollars for it, a brick house on Walloon, on, right on the water. And that house is worth a million dollars today. <laughs> and uh, so, so. Uh, now the ski season doesn't go real long. What happened then that made you transition into golf? Well, uh, the ski business was 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 expensive enough, but uh, and of course we started with. Jim Christensen and oh, and uh, John Norton and I started Boyan. They were the three were the three stockmovers. Well, Jack Don Norton died, and uh, we picked up his stock. And uh, what about Jim? He was Jim, he was Jim, still we, with you for Jim, quite a while, wasn't he? We bought his stock out, yeah. and. Uh, so left me the only stockholder, and then I, I'm the only finance person. So it, it became very burdensome, as you can see outside. All that steel cost millions of dollars, which we don't have, which we but we have a lot of credit. It seems that we have more credit than we have brains, <laughs> and. Uh, I have a son who thinks so. <laughs> or two of them. <laughs> the two of them, two of them, have done a magnificent job. As I've gotten older, they have they have responded beautifully, and they've taken over very well. Uh, so I think a a man is very fortunate when he plans it and trains his kids to to be presidents uh, of many sort of ski ski resorts. When we look at the growth of Boyne USA Resorts, which is just spectacular, and it's a family-owned business, and it started with 40 acres and one dollar. Were you that good a businessman at the very start that you could start this project with one dollar? Well, the one dollar was was all we the 40 acres cost that uh, we built him on, and uh, that was that was extra capital. That was that was people we believed. And, and believed in us because he said, "But what do you want to use it for?" And I said, "Well, we want to we want to build a ski resort." And he said, "Well, anybody who wants to ski on that hill, I just give it to him, and I won't I would not even sell it to him." And uh, it was full of trees. He had no no idea what we were going to do with it, other than what we said we were going to do. He believed it. Well, it certainly turned out. 
Now, by the mid-50s, you bought the property, I think, in about 46 or 47. Yeah. By the mid-50s, you decided uh, that you needed uh, something here besides uh, skiing when the weather was, was different. That's right. Tell us about how you got to the point and, and your first golf course. Well, uh, after we, we, we were in business, we had to have a bar. So that found its way. So I found it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and uh, I had an old crony who was, who was on the ski patrol. He says, Everett, what you need is a golf course. And we were looking at this weed patch through the, through the window, and, uh, and uh, it, it, it appeared to me that being green instead of weedy or brown was, was a more attractive site. But, uh, and uh, so we built it. That was uh, Bill Harbor was yeah, the Bill escape Harbor patrolman, was. and he was a golfer, wasn't he? He had been on the University of Oregon golf team, and uh, so he knew. We thought he knew. He knew a lot more about golf than we did. So, but you've always been a pretty quick learner, right? You got you got into the books and learned how to uh, how to design a course. Well, we we designed it because it was an open field. You could see the. This is the high lows, and and, uh, and of course it didn't cost us much because it, it wasn't irrigated uh, properly. It was irrigated with these old sprinkler heads. The, 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 uh, that was your dad's uh, old tractor, an old uh, and Ford an, tractor, and with an old tractor uh, and uh, and some uh, plowing material. Uh, you could break up the ground and and apply the fairway. Make, make this is where the green's going to be. How much of that course remains of that original nine holes? Well, the, the last of it is where the hotel is. <laughs> that's that, that's the last part. It's been done re several times, but uh, that's the original course. So what made you go then from the little nine-hole executive course at uh, Boyne Mountain to hiring Robert Trent Jones to do a great big championship course up at uh, well, Boyne this Highlands. Is, this is much later after we got Magda Bucks, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we we were successful because, you see, we were successful because the jet airplane had not invented yet. And everybody in the Midwest heard about skiing in Boyne and the chairlift, and that attracted them. And the chairlift, right? And then Stein Erickson right, right. did all that, mm -hmm. did his flips here. So this was the hot place to be? This was the hot place, that's mm -hmm. right. This was the, this the place to be. This is the Midwestern Sun Valley. But the, uh, the snow melts in the spring, and then you have a lot of employees, and what happens then? Well, then, then you you start putting it back, and uh, so it was necessary to have something to do in the summer, and golf was the natural natural thing. And how did you happen to uh, hire Jones, who uh, had made well, a mark at the uh, Oakland Hills was, by toughening in, that in, up? In those in those days, he was the leading architect. In the in the architectural field, but uh, now I you and remember. now you and Jones uh, kind of had a little well, bit of a crusty we'll relationship, you, didn't you? I'll show you the relationship. Of course, in those days, I thought I was equal to him, <laughs> <laughs> and, and um, he thought <laughs> he thought he was king of the hill, and he, he, there can't be two kings on that hill. <laughs> I can remember one, one, one incident where I built a, a trap, and he he just came in on, on you know occasionally. And I was there seven days a week, and he said, and I left a pine tree in the trap, and he says, "Whoever see a pine tree in a trap, I see you see now, you see one now." Don't you? <laughs> <laughs> now you uh, you said that. You changed the number of the holes that uh, he originally designed. Well, to see what he'd get on a jet airplane. By then, 
jet airplanes were, were, were very popular. And, uh, and so he, in his seat in the airplane, he saw this flat ground and he didn't realize there were no trees there because it was a swamp. Well, that's before the, the before the Wetland Act, so we we could just get in there and do anything we wanted to do, except that I'm not going to cross a, a marsh, blueberry marsh, and uh, it, but without filling it, and uh, so we start filling the blueberry marsh, and uh, which is a strict strictly we couldn't build that golf course again today, and yet it's turned into. Uh, uh, but signature on the other golf hand, course. We had to redesign some of the holes that were, that were were called for fill in the long fairways. We just made a crossing. Now, one of the biggest changes you made was on, and it's become a Boyne signature, is the pond on 18. Uh, talk about that well, a little bit. How did that, that come as about? As that turned out, that was an accident that happened several times <laughs> without our knowing it. Uh, <laughs> We finished every hole in those days on water, so we continued that process. So I, I thought it'd be kind of neat if you have a if you're going to have a tournament that have a big bunch of water that everybody's got to hit over, and, because water is so fun. It's final. It's final. Mm -hmm. That's right. Now, how many balls did you did you ever put a ball or two in that water? Oh, in the like, 18, on eighteen. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I have many times, <laughs> <laughs> but uh... you know, Mr. Kirshen, that course, uh, the Jones course in the '60s when it opened, and then of course later it was uh, recognized as one of the top courses in America and still has a tremendous reputation. That course really started the golf boom in northern Michigan, and as we said, brought it to where we're summer golf capital of uh, of America. In reading your biography and knowing a little bit about your personal philosophy, most of the time uh, in the ski business, you just either sold out or, or bought out the opposition or just uh, out uh, outworked them. And yet, you opened the door for the golf industry in northern, Mich northern Michigan that we've never had before. Uh, were you anticipating that that one course and the attention it would bring would turn northern Michigan into such a golf capital? Well. We've also started the real estate boom, and of course the, the golf boom and real estate boom are what keeps Northern Michigan alive today. That's why there's all the traffic. But didn't you resist selling any uh, real estate for quite a while? We, when we first started, a lot was, if we bought a lot for $500, almost, at, at any ski resort. and. Uh, I said, well, that's not enough money. We'll have all our real estate will be gone, and we got nothing for it. And uh, that didn't make any sense to me. So we, we were the last to get in the real estate business. As you know, uh, people were people used to leave born because they wanted to buy real estate, because why aren't you in the real estate business? That was the beginning of the boom. But uh, and and then we so we, I remember I remember it. There's a little little house built on the entrance at the, at the Highlands. Right. It's a it's a pretty little house that was built by uh, we leased in the land, and then uh, he built the house. That's right along the first fairway, right by yeah, the yeah, first he was, hole. He was the executive with with uh, out of Chicago. With Sears, wasn't it? With Sears. Yes. But it was a long time before you uh, started yeah, selling was, uh, lots our, on the golf that course. That was our first, our first venture into real estate. And now isn't that, uh, that's a major part of the business, I can isn't remember it? When you, I can remember driving past that house and, say, and saying, I'll bet you one day this house will be worth, that lot will be worth $5,000. Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, talk about how different the uh, prices are these days. You paid uh, Robert Trent Jones $30,000 to design the right, Highlands, right. and architects these days get a uh, million dollars and more for that's designing right. golf courses. 
if you want to buy a signature golf course, that's a million dollars. Just to start. That doesn't that doesn't include moving the land or, that's or right. anything that's, else. And you got to buy the land. Then you got to hire, hire the architect for a million dollars. Now you've often said that uh, skiing is what pays for the golf. That you get so many more people on the hill on a weekend than you can get on a golf course. Well, but isn't the ski you, season's a little short though, isn't it, compared to the golf season? You, you got to remember you put. 200 people a day through a golf course that might cost you uh, three, four, or five million dollars, and a clubhouse, and all the all the junk, and a ski hill is really nowhere near that expensive, and you can we can ski uh, many times that number of people. We we have skied as many as 10,000 people per resort. But in the real estate side of it, doesn't the summer season sell more than the uh, more than the winter season? Well, we we're hoping it does. <laughs> <laughs> that'll be the fuel for the engine that's uh, well, that'll be behind the expansion. Well, you see, if you if you build a house, you know damn well that there's gonna there's gonna be a rat in it. <laughs> called rat house. <laughs> and uh, so, and you know damn well they're gonna they're gonna come here because this is where the skis are. And uh, and same with golf. You're gonna you're gonna come up north and play golf where your skis are. Where you where you build a house, second home or a third mm -hmm. home, and uh, it's been working out for. Let's talk a little bit uh, after the Heather course, and then you had the Moore course. Uh, then there's a couple of other unique courses. One uh, is the Monument. Talk to us a little bit about the Monument course. Uh, and then the other one I want you to talk about, I, I think you and your son Steve traveled all over the world looking at Donald Ross courses, and you have a Donald Ross course. Tell us about the Monument and the Donald Ross courses. Well, we've... Uh I, I designed and built the monument course, and uh, and we we took the, we we started out with a, we're going to honor a, a, a past great golfer. That's why we call it the monument. And we're going to have a build we'll build these little tees and and call it the the the, the, the Nicholas course. Nicholas Tees, although Nicholas has never been one of my favorite <laughs> people, but he was making more money than I was. <laughs> and uh, so we, uh, we we were successful with it, and we had the land to do it with. We had all the hills, and it just anybody but a damn fool could build a build a golf course, and. Uh, so we were the damn fools that did it, <laughs> and that way we would call it the monument. Okay. However, then we we were tired, sick and tired of playing this million dollars for a, for a, for an architect when we could get Donald Ross for free. <laughs> and and we, we did a little research and found out that we we didn't owe anything to the heirs by doing it, and. Uh, so we were free of lawsuits, and uh, so and we also liked and admired what he had done, and he he had done a very good job on many many famous golf courses. Mm -hmm. That's why they were famous, mm -hmm. and uh, because he had done such a great job, and he worked at uh, he worked at at uh, Pinehurst mm -hmm. for a number of years, and all those years. He he built number two uh, mm -hmm. at, uh, at at, uh, at Pinehurst, and, uh, and that's a very famous golf course. But uh, it had been gone to Rye, gone to weeds and things, and uh, and uh, the time I played it, 
you did, you had to tee your ball up. You had to find a piece of grass. Uh, you know, that was in kind of a down period for uh, yeah, Pinehurst. That, that was that down period. Uh, that's when different you know, owners. Well, that's before Club Corp bought it. Correct. And now it's back to being a jewel. Now, now it's, they've restored it back to its the queen of all golf courses. Mm -hmm. Because it's got the name and it's got the design and it's got the, the living loving care that is needed on a golf course. Now speaking of design, when you started the Alpine course uh, here at the mountain and you had uh, Bill Newcomb who happened to be work, work for uh, Pete Dye uh, a few years earlier than that. He was a young former Michigan amateur champion and he worked with you on that. How did you decide to start a golf course a mile and a half away from the golf shop that was unheard of and up a mountain going up through the woods? How did that come about? Well, I understand his, your question. Uh, you, you say we were involved with Pete Dye was involved in No, that. no. Uh, Bill had worked for Pete well, Dye okay. prior to right. it, prior to that. But uh, here you start a golf course a mile and a half away from the golf shop, a mile and a half away from the cash register, really. And how did that come about? And now you also start the monument from up there. Well, I might uh, say that our, our experience with with Newcomb would indicate that we get as far away from him as we could. <laughs> But tell us a little bit about uh, about the trip going up through the uh, through the woods. Well, that that was necessary because we decided that we we're going to reverse the, the golf. We're going to start on the top of the hill and finish at the bottom because that's the way the mountain was was designed. And uh, and since then, there's been a, a ton of golf courses built following that, that same theory. And uh, and it's worked out, and it's been very successful. But it's never been so successful as, as, the, as the Jones name, the Jones course, or the... So you're, you're better off to... You're better off to, if you've got a, a lousy piece of ground, put a good, good golf course name on it, now you have another strong golf course at, at the Highlands, the Arthur Hills course, and I think that your instructions at the beginning of that were to make a course that was playable for, well, uh, is it, is it for you and Lois, right? For it you and your wife. That, uh, um, well, you see, Bill Harbour is a friend of, of uh, of uh, uh, Arthur Hills, and he wanted me to always, always hire Arthur Hills, mm -hmm. and uh, be, be, so I honored him by by finally doing it, but, and it was an honor to to, to uh, Arthur Hills to be accepted by us, and so he was. He's done three golf courses for us. He built the, he built the, he did a great job on the, on Bay Harbor? On, on, at the Highlands. Uh, right. And, uh, well, the one at the, at the Highlands, uh, isn't that where you kind of instituted a, a more forward tee? Oh, yes. Yeah. And tell us but, about you know, that. How did I, that come about? I had a theory that as, as a guy got older, and of course, as I got older, I got this lesson. I mean, it, when I hit it, hit it off the tee, I just knew I couldn't hit it any further than 150 yards, because 150 yards is a nice drive for women. And uh, some of the guys are struggling out there, like Bill Harbor hits it at 250, but <laughs> sideways. And, and, uh, and I could always play him because I beat him because he would he would hit it sideways and take five or six hitting back. But on the other hand, men 
<clears throat> I'm a little guy, and I, I know damn well, as I got older, I'm not going to hit that ball uh, 220 yards. I couldn't hit it with 220 yards when I was 18. And uh, so as I got older, I knew that I wanted to play golf, you know, up to my 65 years, I mean, even, even that old, you know. As I sit here at 85, this is my birthday today. Right. Yes, happy birthday. And, uh, at 85, um, I would better start getting ready. I'm going to play the course, get out of my wheelchair and, uh, and hit the ball. And uh, everybody's hope is he's gonna hope is what drives you to play the next game. Yes. It's, the, it's the hope that you're gonna hit it as well this time as you did last time. And uh, so keep your eye on the ball. And so you moved up. You uh, put in some additional tees so that you could well, yes, reach so all the fairways. All our tees were out there, two twenty and. And you couldn't play our courses if you, you couldn't you'd get the ball any further than that. So it's uh, so it's that necessary for you to naturally shorten up your tee. Then then the second shot is the, is the one that matters. But then your second shot is way ahead of everybody else's if you use the shorter shorter. Tee. But you can adjust it at that point. Mm -hmm. You were certainly associated with uh, internationally recognized ski uh, people, uh, enthusiasts during your time in, in skiing, and certainly brought some here to, to work uh, at Boyne uh, at your resort. What about golf? Did you really get to the point that you work with some architects, but did you really get involved with, uh, with the golf pros in, 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 ter in times of your career? Uh, well, we, we had to hire them, and they had to have them. So they work, we, we, we naturally worked with those that we did hire. Who was your favorite professional golfer? Your favorite professional golfer? Did you have a golfer that you really liked? Oh, um, he has to be, has to be the, uh, the old guy. It uh, was 80, 85 years old, right. Sam Snead. Okay. See, those those golfers of that era are in my era, and they're my favorite, along with Ben Olgan. Did you travel around the, uh, the the United States, around the world, to play golf? As you did your skiing, you'd go out oh, west. I, did you do the I, same I, golf? I played around the around the country, at all the all the while we were building the Ross Course. I I toured toured many of them. And uh, all those were Ross courses, and we were we're welcomed. Everybody was delighted with that concept, and they welcomed up with open arms because it was a credit to their golf course that someone wanted to build their their hole. You uh, just as you had your ski weeks, you started a golf week, and it's probably one of the best golf packages in America. Is the golf week that you offer here at Boyne was that uh, was that an economical decision or did you really see that there was a market well, niche? Well, you see, like I said, the jet airplane had been had not been built, but yet uh, our ski weeks therefore were immensely popular, and so I just took a lesson out of the past and said if it worked for skiing, maybe it'll work for golf. Well, it has worked for them. We have, we set our sights on 100 golfers a week, and we have 120 now. Mm. Yeah. You have uh, Boeing USA 11 golf courses spread around the United States from Big Sky, Montana, to Boeing South in Florida, nine courses up here in northern Michigan. What, uh, is any one of those your favorite, or what? Uh, of all the projects you've been involved in, what's given yes, you the have, most? Every, everybody has his favorite golf course. That's the one he plays the most. And the one you play the most? The one right here. Is the Alpine course. That's right. Yeah. What's your best score there? Uh, 
What was my score? Right. When I quit playing golf, I shot a 78 as my last game. Wow. But uh, I said, I'm not going to improve on that. But I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> well, you were always a fabulous skier. So did that uh, translate at all into, into playing golf? If I could, if I could hit a golf ball the way I could feel on a pair of skis, I'd have been a, I'd have changed, I'd have changed my name to <laughs> Sam Sneed. <laughs> <laughs> well, you did have Sam here uh, one time and Kathy Whitworth when, uh, at the Monument, right? And uh, dedicated the hole to him or had him uh, dedicate a hole? Well, I don't know how to answer that, but... Mm -hmm. Well, at the at the uh, monument course, uh, I believe there's a, a hole with your name on it. Oh, yeah. uh, how did that come about? Well, if I'm gonna, if I was gonna name a famous golfer, why not the uh, golf course architect? <laughs> 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 well, that's a great reason. I want to just go back now. We're celebrating your 85th birthday today. Uh, it all started in Detroit, didn't it? Uh, tell us a little bit about growing up and, and, and some of the experiences. Uh, you've been in Michigan all your life. Uh, tell us about uh, about those early years. Well, we start, my life started with Ford Motor Company in 1927 when they, Ford Motor Company offered $5 a day. And my father was an automobile, an aspiring automobile mechanic. He wasn't yet. And uh, so he came to Detroit riding the rails, probably, probably from St. Louis, and uh, where I was born. And, uh, and he went to work for Denby Motor Company and, uh, and Ford first. And he didn't, he, he couldn't keep my father in a factory. And uh, just like I have. I have a fellow working for me now, Austrian. Uh, uh, he lives in my house now, he and his wife. And, uh, and he, he disappeared. His cousin's wife put him in a factory. You can't put an Austrian in a factory and expect him to, to be happy. Not when he, when he can't yodel and run around. <laughs> And uh, anyway, he, uh, that any more than you could keep my father in the factory. So, so he left the factory and, and started his own garage and uh, started pulling all his deadbeat trucks into his two-car garage, which he had to build in a hurry. And uh, so it's... That was exactly what uh, what we started. I, I mean, I remember carrying my father's lunch to him uh, day after day after day during vacation periods when I wasn't in school, and uh, and we were happy doing it. And uh, and my father worked six and a half days a week, and on Sunday we'd get in, in the Haines car and we'd go for a drive. Mm -hmm. That was the, that was the week. Yeah. That's week entertainment. You uh, said that during those depression years and tough years, your family did okay, that your dad's yeah, working on, you did all right during that time. That's right. Mm -hmm. he, he did, uh, he's a hard worker and anybody was willing to work hard, why, if he had a, an opportunity to work, could uh, could make make ends meet. Now, before you got into the resort business, uh, you had a couple of ventures. One that you, one or two, you said didn't work out quite as well. Uh, 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 some car sales and trailer sales. Tell us a little bit about those experiences. I started in a trailer business, house trailer business, before people were living living in them when they were made from built not only trailers and. Uh, I was renting them out, and uh, they, they cost me maybe $500 in those days, 
and I would rent a car, a, a, a trailer out, and I rent a program, and uh, and I pay for the trailer in one year, or even in a half a year. I was renting them for a hundred dollars a week, and uh, in those days that was pretty damn good money. But then on the other hand, I had to charge that much because a guy could drive away with it. So we took precautions against it. And uh, about the uh, one story goes into another. We, we started selling them, and I was taking the finance charges off of a, off the finance company's chart. And it got the rate, the rate was almost 20 percent on a, a, a year equating back. So, and then the, the insurance, you had to you have to have a license to sell insurance. We didn't have a license to sell insurance, so we just included insurance into the package. Then, curiously enough, we 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 ran out of money. That's no no question about that. We're not in the finance business or in the insurance business, so we're not wealthy. So we don't have a, a bottomless pit. So we sold our paper to a fellow in Grand Rapids called Mr. Fry. Mr. Fry also went in the insurance business after he saw or read some of the prices I was getting for insurance, <laughs> my insurance costs. He jumped into the insurance business and sell, uh, exclusively selling insurance on house trailers. I invested one million, a uh, hundred thousand dollars in that company. Many years later, and walked out of the stock market with two million dollars. <laughs> <laughs> so it tells you what what I missed. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's what I missed. Yes. <laughs> what about the car dealership? Uh, it wasn't quite as uh, successful a story, was it? No. That's that's one of my success stories. That's the first time I ever told it, <laughs> but uh, but that's uh, that's a true story. I didn't even put it in my book. <laughs> <laughs> was that the foremost insurance? Is that what that became? Foremost, yeah. yeah. They sold out to a to another company, and now the the, the Fry family, the old man is dead now. The Fry family has started a foundation. And they've, uh, they're just giving them money away, you know. The largest insurer of mobile homes in the country. Right, that's right. Certainly in, uh, in your lifetime you've seen uh, America go through a lot of changes, the state of Michigan go through a lot of changes, the city of Detroit go through a lot of changes. Uh, as you look back, uh, what's your feeling? I mean, you had a philosophy, a uh, work ethic, uh, uh, what's your general sense as you just take a minute and look back on the last uh, 85 years? Well, uh, I've grown strong, stronger a Republican since since all this, since Roosevelt, and uh, I don't think uh, we, our family just when, when or we, you you are what your family is. If your family is a Democratic, why well, you're going to end up being a Democrat. Or Catholic, or whatever it is, and uh, so I was fortunate enough to just be born of a Republican, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and that was right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you certainly have uh, kept your family involved uh, in this process, um, but there are some other individuals that have played a big part in your life and the development, uh, uh, serving as general managers and. Uh, serving as, as friends. Uh, who are a couple of those people? And certainly I want you to talk about your family too because you've got uh, all the children you know, involved. The, uh, Chuck Ball was, was, a, was a, a best general manager we ever had. And uh, fortunately he's, unfortunately he's gone. But that's what you, we're all going to go. And you face that in, in, in business 
and so you 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 load you load what you can practically on on one person, and he could take a load, and he worked very well, and he was he was uh, Dutch and frugal and a good businessman. Without him, I wouldn't be anywhere near where I am today. Mm -hmm. And the children? The children and oh, yeah. Stephen and John and your daughters? Uh, I have four children. They're all in the business here. Uh, my eldest son, Stephen, my youngest son, Stephen, is in East, is here with, well, in their Eastern operations. And John Kircher is in our Western operations. I put him on a big sky and that was a in the in the early days. That was a rough, rough trip, and uh, everybody was shooting at us because I had bought this. I had bought it from corporate Chrysler Corporation. Therefore, we we carried the same image as Chrysler Corporation, mm -hmm. and everybody was shooting at us, mm -hmm. yeah. like everybody's shooting at uh, everybody's shooting at the dollars, you know. Mm -hmm. Well, you've made that into a very successful operation out there, right? Well, he's he's turned it into a into a fabulous resort, and uh, he's aggressive and young and and willing to take a chance. So and, Stevens kind of doing the same thing around here. Uh, and Stevens started doing the same thing around here, and now we find that. Uh, they're shooting at us <laughs> because we went too far and too fast. Do you, do you think that you have? I think I know we have. When when we're living on credit, you always you pay, always wanted we got a lot of the money to pay the bills. That's too far. You that's always, further than I ever went. <laughs> you always followed a more conservative uh, line and built a pretty nice operation out of it. Well, it just takes more time. But uh, youth is not willing to wait. They want it all right now. Of all this time, over your 85 years and, and what you have done in the resort business, what gives you the most what gives you the most pleasure? Do you sit back at night and think about everything that you've done? What What do you get a, especially get a big kick out of? Well, you, you if you sit back and and count count the dollars you owe versus the dollars <laughs> coming in. No, no, I'll get on the positive side. Now. Come on, you have, you have to get some smile, some pleasure, some happiness out of this. You, you've got that one sign in here someplace, uh, he who dies with the most toys wins, whatever. Well, you've had a lot of toys. And, and That's right. Certainly, too many toys. And you have... Uh, too many toys you, when you get 85. You hunted and you fished all over the world. You played well, golf. Right. You that's skied right. with uh, Olympic champions. You hired Olympic champions. That's, right. that's a, a pretty strong uh, resume. Well, that's... That's... That's the proper words to put in, uh, in the word called satisfaction. But, uh, is there anything else? Is there anything else that you uh, want to do specifically that you haven't done? Have you have you accomplished most of the goals that you wanted, or the things that you wanted to do in life, or is there still something else you want to do? Well, a year ago, I would have said. Uh, I want to build a new hotel, and, and I've always said that. Uh, that's probably, probably this is where I started, and uh, this is where I like end up. But are you going to say give up or end up? What's the end of the story? Is there more to it than that? Somehow, I think there's going to be a lot more to it. I I really appreciate the time you've taken with us today because. You're known as Michigan's resort pioneer. You 
came looking for a real mountain, as you called it, and uh, you found Boyne Mountain, and now you have uh, other ski resorts. So you've made a tremendous impact on the state of Michigan, and in fact, uh, the whole United States, and uh, so much to be uh, recognized for, and we appreciate the time you've taken here to tell us a little bit about uh, those experiences. So thanks for uh, joining uh, with us in this. Well, thank you for putting the show together. Thank you. And uh, particularly Jack Berry, that I've known for a lot of years. You may have to tell me after we go off uh, off the air, you may have to tell me how many years, because he won't tell me. <laughs> okay. It's been a long time and very enjoyable. <laughs> did, did, did we miss anything? Can you pick up the rest of it on the ski part there? I think it's good. Yeah, I think that's great.